is Luke Haig at uh, my home, and you're looking at an original 1780 Girardoni 46 caliber 22 shot repeating air rifle. And I'm going to go over just a little bit how this rifle works and how you prepare it. The 46 caliber lead balls would be loaded in this tubular magazine. So they would be in this side tube. It has a flat spring. There's no spring inside of the tube, so gravity is used to bring the bottom ball into this position. The shooter would then press this lever, spring-loaded lever. It's under tension at the moment. That picks up the bottom ball, releasing it, moves it into the firing position. To fire the gun, there's two positions on the hammer. And after that, it works like any normal true firearm. Pulling of the trigger, I'm going to dry fire it. It's pretty loud. The shooter would then simply push this loading bar, release it, cock it, fire it, load it, cock it, fire it, and continue to do so until you exhausted the ammunition supply. And again, that could be as many as 22 projectiles. Where's the air coming from? The stock is a reservoir. So I'm going to take it off the rifle. It's threaded on. It has a check valve, obviously, or we would hear a lot of air escaping. If you zoom in or come closer, you can see this pin protruding from the back of the threaded area. That pin uh, protrudes toward the camera when the hammer falls and pushes against a check valve, a one-way valve in the reservoir, releasing by design and by timing just the right amount of air to launch the ball. So let's look at the marrying or the interfacing piece. Here's the back of the air reservoir. Now the rifle is an original Girardoni, one of just a few in the country. This is a replica made by Ernie Cowan of the reservoir. The originals are too dangerous and too fragile to pressurize. The pressure has been estimated to be about 800 to 850 psi in the buttstock reservoir. Next thing I want to show you is the interesting rifling. We can get around and see the muzzle. It almost looks like ratchet, what was called ratchet rifling, but it's, uh, for the most part, more or less conventional. It's 12 lands and grooves. A cast would suggest it was a hook scraper method of rifling, uh, but still the lands have an unusual shape. I have collected some fired projectiles, and it does look possible uh, to match them under the comparison scope, and we'll give that a try later. Now, if we can back off again, I want to talk a little bit about the ramrod. Again. This does not use a patched ball, it's a bare lead ball that engages the rifling, but there is a ramrod on it. And that's not only for cleaning, the usual cleaning purposes, but also if you get a stuck projectile. You simply take the ramrod, push the ball back down all the way to the loading bar. So that stuck ball would now be back in the loading bar, and you could either push it over, tip the gun downward, and let gravity put it back in the loading tube and remove it, or simply leave it in place, cock the hammer, and have another attempt at uh, firing it. If you can back out now, I want to show you the kit that was provided every Austrian soldier between about 1780 and I think the gun lasted maybe about 10 years in service, and then it became a sniper's weapon. Here's the, the kit. So what are we looking at? This long side tube is the pump to charge the air reservoir. So let's just take it out for a moment, separate it, and we'll see how this works in a moment. Set that aside. Let's open up the rest of the kit. Inside for such things as a ladle for melting lead, 
There's a bullet mold to cast the nominally 46 caliber bullets. So we pour the ball, the lead, open it up, dump it out, and then we'd have to deal with the sprue, the little uh, tit that's on the projectile. Ah, this is the rest of the pumping system. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Very ingenious. It's probably very dark, but there are four what we would today call speed loaders. These have as many as 20 lead balls in them. You can probably hear them. This one isn't quite full. A little latch here on the end. So let me swing it aside and I'll just bring them up to the point. There we can see one of the 46 caliber, normally 464 to 467, about 153 grain lead ball. So let's see how you would use it with the rifle. Let's go back to the to the rifle. This also is an ingenious little latch. You have to push it forward first and then swing it to one side. I would then take a speed loader. And hopefully the audio picked that up. And I'm just going to back away a little bit. I'm just going to tip the gun so we can hear that it's got quite a few in it, but not totally full. Otherwise, there'd hardly be any movement. Now, if I were to move this lever, we'd put a ball in position. Only one problem. I don't have the air reservoir. Let's go back to the kit. In that kit would be two extra air reservoirs. So let me bring this around a little bit. You can see the back end of them. So we've got four speed loaders, casting material, two, and of course in battle, these would have been pre-charged. So we take one out, take the used one, the empty one off of our gun, and simply thread this on and make it hand tight. Let's look at how we how the Austrians pump these up. So I'm going to set it aside for just a moment. Let's go back to the pump. This also is ingenious. The U-shaped slot accepts this rounded piece and if you can see down in there there's a little impression, a well. The tip of this is going to go into that. Why? The reason is so it's free to swivel. If this were a rigid system, we might break the pump. So if we can go and stand by a moment, I'm going to set this down on the... I'm going to do it here. Just, just keep it running. So what else do we need? We need an empty reservoir. And we thread it on like so. I'm not going to do it all the way because there's still some air in this. It's not empty. And I'm going to step back just a little bit. I'm an Austrian soldier. Really should put shoes on, I suppose. And pump. 1,500 strokes. 1,500 strokes will give us about 800 to 850 PSI by calculation. It's estimated that took about 20 minutes to complete. So, I've got it pumped up. Somebody can count to 1,500 in German, unscrew it. It would be hot by then. We'd know we'd pressurized it. And I can either put it back in the kit or assemble it on the rifle. Hand tight. Markings. This one has been buffed out, as many of them, I'm told, that have been seen in Europe have. There's a faint vestige of a number three here, but the serial numbers would have been in this area. Uh, there was some information, proof marks, something in this area that have also been buffed out. If you get the light on it just right, there's a flat spot there. You can see some sort of an indexing mark. Uh, open sights, a typical sight of even today, iron sight. A little brass front sight that's drifted in. We've already looked at the rifling. 
There's arrangements for a sling here and here. Single stage trigger. That is not an adjustment for trigger pull, the little screw that you might see behind the trigger. So there you have it. A description, a general description of an original Girardoni 46 caliber air rifle, the Austrian Army, later used by Austrian snipers, and because of its complexity, ultimately abandoned, and virtually all of them were to be destroyed. A few have survived. You're looking at one of them, one of the very few in the United States. And this rifle and the accoutrements are owned by Mike Carrick, who's an arms historian. Uh, he's involved in the we proceeded on journals quarterly for the Lewis and Clark expedition. He's, uh, I think, the editor of Heritage Arms and an avid collector of rare and very expensive and very unusual firearms of all types. I hope every AFTI member has an opportunity to meet Mike Carrick. He's, he's a wealth of information, uh, knows a lot about old guns, how they work, uh, where they came from, who used them, and especially the Lewis and Clark air gun.